Hello and welcome to Fresh Perspectives. My name is Gail. And before I introduce my guest for the day, I have a special announcement to make. The episode we are doing today is episode number 100. And mm -hmm. um, I've, I've, um, I, I wanna say thank you to a lot of people who've helped to make this possible. To begin with, I would like to say thank you to the late Reed Powers because it was being interviewed on his television program, uh, Senior Report, that led to this. I'd like to thank Russ Vallone uh, for suggesting that the possibility that I was really good at being interviewed and that I should have my own television talk show. I want to thank the crew, uh, all of the guys that work here at the studio, Randy Burr and his two sons, uh, Chris and Justin, uh, Jeff Zook, um, Doc Hamill, uh, Galen Zook, uh, Jeff's brother who stops by the studio to visit and kind of uh, has some fun conversations with us sometimes. And also uh, to Chrissy and Devin DeJury, who made the uh, opening music for the program. And to all of my uh, really awesome guests that I've had um, on my TV show, on Fresh Perspectives. Um, I couldn't have done it without any of them. And, um, it just happens that the guest that I have on today is the guest who's been on the most often. <laughs> uh, so, um, and that would be, if you haven't already figured it out, um, Bill Kuick from Fredonia. Thank you. And uh, he's from, he owns Fredonia Massage Therapy. He's an organic gardener and he's done a bunch of other things on Fresh Perspectives too. So. Um, well, thanks for having me, Gail. Yeah. And congratulations you know, on oh, your 100th oh, oh, show. Oh, thank you. I think uh, I've been on 99 of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know you have a spider crawling on the front of I your do, shirt? I do, yeah, it's uh, part of my <laughs> shirt. <laughs> Okay. I, I want to thank the, uh, the the makeup and hair artists because I wouldn't look this great if it wasn't for them. <laughs> yeah, as if we would have makeup and hair artists on a 5013C television <laughs> program or television studio. Uh, so uh, Bill is on today to um, talk about uh, growing garlic and cover cropping. And we're going to start out with growing garlic so yeah um, well and like we were saying your your husband just planted his and mine has been in it was actually we we did it two weeks ago thursday we got most of it in i was about 50 cloves short so uh -oh. uh, we, we finished it up we finished it up on on friday so two weeks ago yesterday and for me this is perfect this is the way i like to see it uh, happen where uh we had you know pretty much like two weeks of above freezing uh, temperatures. It, it was all mulched uh, already too. 
uh, but we um, uh, we got it all planted. And I, I was telling you, I, I've been I've had a couple of weaker crops the last couple of years, so uh, this year I uh, I tried to do it uh, do everything right. So uh, we do have some some photographs I uh, uh, took of the uh, the soil. I, I brought in um, to these three beds where the garlic is going to be planted. It's I, I could say there was probably roughly two yards of uh, of really nice compost went in it and. Uh, for those that don't know, two yards is about two good-sized pickup truck load uh, fulls of compost. And uh, I also added about 100 pounds of, um, no, 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 I'm sorry, 50 pounds of Jersey green sand, which uh, actually is, uh, for those that don't know, it's an ancient um, algae beds that have become petrified. And somewhere in New Jersey, they mine this stuff. It's just like sand. It looks like grunt sand that's green, but it's loaded with... Um, phosphorus and potassium, but uh, also added uh, lime, which I haven't been adding the last couple of years. So I thought, well, let's put it, I put, did put 100 pounds of lime uh, onto that, onto those uh, beds. And uh, we worked it in and let it sit for a while. And then it was starting to grow a few weeds. So just before planting, um, that was uh, tilled up. And I know we have a picture of that, uh, the, the, uh, the soil. This is, this is the picture of the, the three beds that uh, had all those uh, amendments and uh, and um, uh, compost put into it, and I believe the next picture is uh, Matt. Um, oh no, those are the cloves. We how we pop the cloves. So you have to separate the cloves from the uh, from the bulb. So that's done just before, and that variety is Music Pink. I'm only growing two varieties. I was doing 13 up until just a couple of years ago, but um, the next picture would be uh, my. Uh, oh, that's just another view of the. The bed from a different direction. This is facing west, the other one was facing east, and then uh, the next one is my helper, uh, Matt Playster, uh, just finishing that, that last bed up. So there's there's three rows to each bed, and where the low spot is, that's the very narrow uh, walkway. So uh, there's about a thousand bulbs uh, <clears throat> planted in that, uh, that area. And, uh, you know, basically, I mean, you just, you know, pull off the clove and I usually go about an inch deep, so the, the top of the, the clove is about an inch below the, the surface of the soil. And what I like to see is, like I said, I mean, I like to plant with about two weeks of above freezing temperature because I like to see the roots grow uh, a bit, and I'd like to see the top grow, but to still stay uh, underground. Oh, and I think we had the one more, uh, one more picture, uh, which was the, uh, the, those are those beds now completely mulched. and. Uh, I, I said either by accident or by design, divine design, um, we went to a local farm to uh, pick up the uh, the hay, and it's always been a pay and take kind of thing. But the uh, original owner uh, passed away last year, so it's I really hadn't been over there much. But um, I had a, a kind of a low wet spot, so we we got some hay a couple of weeks before this, and we just put it down on that. And then uh, when we went to go get the mulch hay for this, I said, well, we're probably going to need like roughly four bales and uh, we grabbed two what looked to be the last two mulch hay but there was two what looked to be feed hay that were kind of green on another trailer so I was like well I'll just it's usually there's a can there and you leave the money while well, I put money in, a, in an envelope we, we left it there and when we got back I said well you know what let's put the greener stuff down first because that will have a tendency to break down quicker because it has more nitrogen in it and then we'll put the dry stuff on top and um, we started to break these bales apart. I'm like, oh, oh my God, this is alfalfa, which is actually <laughs> about the best thing that you could put down there because it's loaded with nitrogen and other, other nutrients. So we put a layer of alfalfa hay on top of those beds first, and then there was um, some actual straw. It was actually straw, it wasn't even hay. The one, one was actually a slightly moldy uh, alfalfa, which I know uh, somebody uh, was like, well, but, but there's mold on it. It's like, but it's mulch. I mean, it's not gonna, uh, affect the uh, the mm -hmm. garlic, but um, but typically too though I sometimes wait until we get colder weather before I'll put the mulch on, and I know I was telling Matt I, I said there there's been times where I've come home from my office at three o'clock in the afternoon on Christmas Eve and I'm out there putting mulch down in a blizzard, and I know there was one year it was actually December 26th, and somebody wanted an appointment. I usually don't work at my office on the 26th, but I was like. This woman was in visiting family and her back was bothering her. So I said, all right, but look, my dog needs to go to the vet. 
I need to mulch this garlic, and then I'll see you at about 3 o'clock. And I remember being out there in a blizzard, hands freezing, and trying to put, <laughs> put mulch down uh, in, in a blizzard. But uh, uh, you got to have the passion, right? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, really good to have, you know, a, a good amount of, uh, of fresh uh, compost every year uh, in your soil. The, the, the limestone, I, I have to say, is, is key. I really do believe that uh, having plenty of extra um, uh, lime in the soil is, is it, it's, it for anything in that, in the onion and garlic family. Uh, I know when I used to plant onions, I, I used to get really, really big, um, uh, nice onions. I would actually plant... I would actually spread the bags of lime into the soil, rototill it in, and then just as I was ready to plant, I would put more lime over the top of the bed. And I had a board with nails on each edge, and I would use that board to uh, just kind of scratch in that lime, and that would be where the, where the onions were planted. And then that was my measurement for the next row. So I would just roll that board to the next one and make the lime, then roll it over, and then that would be my lime, and there would be more, more lime there. So. Uh, but again, too, and I've said this before on the other uh, organic gardening um, shows, always, uh, I always highly recommend going to Cornell, getting your soil tested, and just knowing where you're at with your, your pH and your organic matter and, and all your, your nutrients because, uh, uh, you know, they can give you a very... And, and I know other people, they say, well, you know, you can buy those test kits, and, and I'm sure you could, but um, when they do it, you know it's done right. And, and, and they will... I, if, if you've never done it, it, it's. I believe this is the way you do it. You go to the lab there in in, in Portland, and I think it's twenty five dollars. You give them the twenty five dollars. They give you the kit. You fill out the paperwork that tells like what crops you're planning on growing. Uh, they tell you how to take the soil sample. Uh, that goes into a bag, into a plastic bag that's sealed up. Goes into a cloth bag, and then I believe now we used to used to mail that to Cornell, but now I believe you take it back to the lab. So I suppose if you wanted to, you could actually have, if you know how to take the sample, you could take your sample with you, then go to the lab, pay for it, and then you wouldn't have to make two trips. But uh, um, anyway, uh, but yeah, they, I mean, they will give you very, very specific instructions as to like what that soil needs for each individual crop that you grow. Uh, and you know, you, you kind of when you're starting out, it's not a bad uh, idea. And speaking of starting out, I, I, I wanted to bring this up because a lot of people <coughs> think that you know, and garlic, you can grow garlic in any kind of soil. I mean, any, any, any kind of soil will grow garlic, but if you want to grow, like, really, really great garlic, um, it, it's good to uh, do some preparation uh, of your soil. And I, I know my friend, uh, now late friend uh, Jeff, thought at one point, he's like, well, you know, people are really into garlic. He's like, I'm just going to plant, like, 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 five acres of garlic he was, he was going to plant. And he said that he had an old hay field that had been sitting fallow for all these years, and he figured he would just till that all up and plant uh, um, garlic into it. I, I, I kind of thought it, 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 it's, there's going to be a lot of weed seeds in that soil if it's been laying fallow for all the, those years. And, uh, and this kind of ties into our, our second topic of the, the cover cropping. But uh, Ron England, who wrote the book uh, Growing Great Garlic, he said the exact same thing. He said, you know, there's a lot of people out there that think that they're going to make a lot of money growing garlic by just planting it in a in a fallow uh, hay field. But he, he said he said you will have like so many weed problems. He said you will be so frustrated. He said you'll never be able to keep up with the weeds. He said at best you'll end up with a lot of really really poor quality garlic. And he said you'll probably never do it again after the first year because it's going to be so much work and you're not going to get anything out of it. And what he suggests, my my friend was just like, oh, well, I mean, how much would you get for that garlic doing all that? But he suggests two years of cover cropping before you you actually plant your garlic if you have had a field that was oh. laying, laying fallow. And I want to say he planted like a, the first summer he planted like a mixture of like red clover and some like grass of some kind, like maybe a ryegrass. And then where he is, he's on, he's on the mountains just east of, uh, of Seattle. I almost went there when I was in Seattle. Uh, but it was about a three-hour drive. But um, he, he has to irrigate because that's like a very arid um, mountain desert kind of area where he is. But he says after, you know, growing this, this summer, you know, clover and grass, he tills that under and then plants winter rye. I think he actually planted winter rye, clover, and vetch for the, for the winter. And then, uh, and then the next summer, 
he planted two successions of buckwheat and then winter rye again the next winter and then I think yeah, then I think he cover crops again the whole next summer and then he plants the next fall. So it's a full year, two it's it's, it's a full two years of cover cropping uh, before he uh, he plants his garlic. But in that way, I mean the buckwheat actually is a really great aid, especially in the summertime, to choke out any weeds. So you use like less uh, you won't need any herbicide or you won't need to uh, um, you know, do as much uh, hand weeding if you do those successions of buckwheat. And then all those other things are adding organic matter and nutrients to, to the soil uh, you know, as they grow and as you uh, turn them back under. And uh, I actually did that, not, not with just garlic in the area that I do grow garlic, but um, when I first started gardening, what I call my middle garden by my, my barn, um, I did actually cover crop for, for two full seasons before I planted anything in there. And I, and I do think it, it really does make, it did make a big difference. And it, my uh, first thing was, it was in the summer of, I don't remember what year, but uh, soybeans. I, I planted soybeans and uh, they, they grew like really, really big. Beginning of August, I, I pulled some up. I could see there's little pink nodules on the roots that are your nitrogen uh, not nodes. And um, I knew that there was, they had produced the nitrogen. They were starting to, to form beans. So I went through with the brush hog and I chopped it, let it lay for a little bit and then turn that under, and then I planted, I made up my own fall-winter mix, and I planted um, winter rye, clover, and peas, and it, it grew really, really nice. It was, it was probably at least like this when we started getting the, the colder weather. By April 30th the next year, so before the 1st of May, it was, it was waist high. Uh, the, the peas die off during the winter, but you still have the clover and the uh, oats. So I chopped that, and then turn that under, and then I, when it was warm enough, like just a couple weeks later, I planted buckwheat, but I let the buckwheat go to seed. Um, let it, I think it, I think it takes 10 or 11 weeks for the buckwheat to go to full, full maturity. And again, chopped it, let it dry a little bit on top of the soil, and then I loosely, lightly fluffed that into the soil so those seeds would regrow. So I got two plantings of buckwheat out of paying for one, let's say one bag of buckwheat seed. I got two plantings out of that because I let it go to seed itself. And then I tilled the second batch in before it went to seed. So I didn't have seeds as a problem after that. And then winter rye again the next winter. And then it was the next spring that I started planting on there. So, you know, it was the, the first summer it was the um, soybeans. The winter was the um, rye, peas, and, um, and um, clover and then two successions of buckwheat the next summer, and then another winter into the spring of, uh, of winter rye. And, uh, and it does, it, it just, I don't know, they, there's, it, it just conditions the soil. It makes the soil like that much nicer than, even if, even if you just add compost, it's, it's not the same as uh, uh, adding, um, uh, you know, growing those, those different cover crops. But, uh, but yeah, then, uh, you know, ideally, if you plant your garlic, and, and the reason I, I actually wait until, for me, you know, near to, to Lake Erie, I'm, I'm on Webster Road in Fredonia, I actually wait until about, I'd like to wait until the very end of October, around Halloween. I know it's tradition in Fredonia that uh, people plant their garlic around, uh, uh, actually on uh, Columbus Day, but uh, I, I personally find that a little early. The first year that I was here, uh, growing was in 91 and I read the USDA climate maps and their suggestions and they said to start on October 15th to October 30th roughly and I was going to plant 300 pounds of garlic so I thought I should start early because I didn't know how long it would take me to grow it and uh, or to plant it and uh, I think it took me till about the 28th to get it all in, but it was a super, super mild beginning of November. December was really mild, and my garlic was probably 10 inches to a foot tall before Christmas, and uh, then we had a very dry and cold winter, so um, it kept blowing my mulch away. I was out there, I remember being out there in January with a rake trying to get all my stuff back on it. It, it, it didn't work out, but burned all the tops off the garlic, and my, my biggest bulbs were maybe an inch, and so after that, I said, you know, it, it, it doesn't really make any sense to start early. Just wait until the end. And I was telling you that it was literally uh, one year ago, yesterday, that I planted my garlic last year, 
And, uh, but we did, we did get it in two weeks ago uh, this time around. So, uh, you know, ideally it, the roots grow a little bit in the fall, the top grows a little bit, but not out of the ground. So if, it's, so if, the, so if the clove is planted an inch deep, I wouldn't mind it growing maybe at a half inch or almost an inch, but I don't really want it coming out of the ground. But ideally we have a cold winter, it all stays in suspended animation all winter long. And then, um, you know, when we get our first warmer days, maybe next March, then it starts to come up out of the ground. And then um, uh, we, uh, we then have nice big plants by uh, June 21st. And that's, that's the thing too, that they are um, photosensitive. So um, it is actually the, uh, the shortening days after, let's say, the, the summer solstice. So let's say after June 21st, when they notice, then the garlic starts noticing the days are getting a little shorter, that's when it triggers them to, uh, to bulb. So uh, I, I remember someone we know saying that, oh yeah, you, you plant your garlic on the shortest day of the year and you harvest it on the longest day of the year. I'm like, so you'd be planting your garlic on December 21st and harvesting on June 21st? I don't think so. But, um, it, you know, like I said, fall. And I, I usually figure people ask me, when, when, do, you, when do you harvest? And uh, I don't know about you, but uh, I used to say the week of the Chautauqua County Fair, but um, some years it's you know more like middle or earlier uh, July, but usually you know about the about the middle of July or so. Carl usually harvests uh, the garlic sometime in July. Usually, so. no, no. I, I grow uh, the two two strains that I'm growing right now are all hardneck, and um, they're um, grown primarily for for their flavor. Um, they do keep actually fairly well, but. There are two different types of garlic, your hard neck and your soft neck. Soft, ne soft necks are the ones that usually see braided. Um, those are um, Ophio sativum. Uh, some people call those the um, artichoke garlic. And if you look at those bulbs, you'll see the, the outer row is the big cloves and then the cloves get smaller and smaller as they go to the inside. And again, that's the, the soft neck. So that's the Ophio sativum and then the the hard neck are Ophio scorundon, and they only have one row of cloves, but the stalk is really, really hard. And you can braid them if you crack the, the stalk when it's still green. There's a way to do that. I, I don't really see the point myself, but I've never done it. But uh, uh, so yeah, you have the, you have the two, two completely separate strains. Now, the way I understand it, I have heard that like top chefs will buy the hard neck garlic even when it's starting to go bad, like even when it's starting to get, get moldy oh. before they'll buy the soft neck because the soft neck really just doesn't have the intense flavor. Oh, is that right? Right. Now, the, I, I, I said earlier, I, I was growing 13 varieties of garlic up until just a couple of years ago and then I just got to the point where I'm going, well, these two are my favorites and the other ones were garlic, but it wasn't like there was anything super special about any, I mean, some of the color, I mean, I, I was growing this chestnut red and the, uh, I mean, the, the bulb wrappers and the clove wrappers were, I mean, like a, like a, like a cranberry red. I mean, super, super uh, red. Like, like it's supposed to be a better, better variety for roasting, but I never really got bulbs uh, of, of really great size. So the music pink I grow, uh, supposedly, according to some garlic guru, that's like the most flavorful garlic in the world. Personally, I can't say. I've never tried every variety in the world, but uh, the other one is super, super hot and spicy. If you eat it raw, uh, and it's uh, Korean red, and uh, I use that uh, when I make my uh, Korean uh, kimchi. But, uh, but yeah, like I said, I, I usually plant like late October. I usually figure it's ready, uh, you know, middle middle of uh, July, later July. And and the way that I determine personally how when I'm going to pick it, the, the leaves start to, to get yellow from the bottom up. And uh, the way Ron England says, he says, you don't, because some, some people say, you just wait for the plant to be like dead and dry. With soft necks, you can do that. With the hard neck, what's going to happen if you pull that out after the whole thing is dead and dry, you'll have all the cloves in a cluster, but the wrappers are all rotted off already. So um, what I do and what he says is you need to have three to five still green leaves on them and those are each one of your wrappers and he says sometimes you lose one wrapper when you harvest so now you're down to four and then you lose another wrapper while you're cleaning so now you're down to three and then he says sometimes in shipment you lose like another wrapper so you know if, if it's going to be sold in a store and it wants to look good most, most people aren't going to pick the bulb that's all like all the all the outer wrapper is all gone and you just see the individual cloves so 
you want to have one or two wrappers still on. And I, I know that most people are probably uh, doing it for, for home use, but, uh, um, but still, I mean, if you leave if at least three green leaves, at least you'll have a wrapper on the outside. And they, they actually keep better, uh, they store better that way uh, also. So, uh, uh, and, and actually he, because of he's, he's in such an arid spot, he does things a little bit differently than what I do. I tried to do what he did, but um, he said that they're super careful to not even leave the garlic out in the sun at all. Uh, they, they have like a, a canopy over the top of their um, cart on the back of the tractor, and then they, they harvest like an amount, and then they take it right into the barn to keep it like, you know, cool. But I have found that my garlic will actually start to decay if I try to keep it like that. But he, you know, he lives in a desert. And we're not really in a desert. Here. No, no. Um, so I've, I've, I've actually uh, had, I, I will actually sometimes harvest my garlic and leave it lay in the sun for a day. I mean, I'll just leave it on the ground. If it's not going to rain, I'll leave it out. And sometimes the next day I'll flip it over and leave it in the sun for a second day. Then I bundle it up and, uh, and hang it in my barn or in a, in a building to dry. But, um, the thing is, he he does too. He says he will not. He they say they do like a general, like they brush the the brush it off a little bit, hang it, but then they clean it later. But I found, and I think for me, it's probably because I have so much organic matter in my soil that if I leave them a little bit dirty while they dry, the compost or whatever is dark in the soil will sort of stain the wrappers. So I actually, as soon as they're harvested, I actually will peel the outer wrappers off so I get this really beautiful, I should have brought some, some a really nice white bulb and it, it just has a uh, more appeal. I think it, it looks better when it's, uh, when it's cleaned, uh, for me, more immediately. But again, him too, I mean, he lives more in a desert area so it probably dries a whole lot more, uh, more quickly. But, um, and I, I suppose you too know, I, and there's something, that I'm sure a lot of people that don't grow their own garlic have never experienced, but that when you first pick it, it is so like crunchy and so juicy. It's like a completely uh, uh, different product. And, and one thing else, uh, another thing I'd, I'd like to mention, and I know a lot of people that, that have eaten a lot of garlic in their life don't understand this, but you can actually pull the garlic green like in the month of May and maybe the beginning of June, uh, and you can eat the whole stalk and everything. It's a milder uh, form of garlic. And I know a lot of people say, but, but what is it? What, what is green garlic? It's like, well, it's the same as like, you have a green onion and you have a bulb onion. They're both onion, but the one could have been a scallion or one could have been an, a young onion picked a little bit earlier. And it's the same thing with the green garlic. And sometimes uh, I'll have restaurants that'll order like whole bushels of green garlic from, from me. And uh, one of the things I know, my, one friend of mine who's a great chef uh, will do is he'll just grind that completely up, just puree the whole green garlic. I mean, you cut the roots off it, maybe clean up the uh, uh, the leaves a little bit, but they puree the whole thing. And uh, I, I know people that are vegan might be uh, offended by this, but he'll actually mix that with butter. So he's got this, this green garlic butter. And then uh, when he serves a steak to someone, he'll take a scoop of that and put it on just to finish it. So you've got this mild garlic taste and all that, mm -hmm. that rich mm -hmm. uh, buttery mm -hmm. flavor over the top of it. But. I am going to interrupt you for a moment, um, just to let you know for one thing that we are halfway through okay. our time that we have for today. And uh, for another thing, um, this is what I get for not having everybody's names written down when I made my earlier announcement. Uh. We also uh, have, uh, I didn't mention uh, to say thank you to Chuck Kelsey, who is the station manager. And um, Devin Taylor, who organized, uh, made it possible for me uh, to have this program. And uh, for Devin, Devin and his wife, Nancy, uh, for helping me come up with the name Fresh Pers Perspectives for this television show. So thank you to all of you also. And um, are, do you ha still have some more to say about garlic? Uh, I think I think I, we could wrap that up, and then and we could talk more about uh, cover cropping. And okay. I, I know you said that you know you guys don't usually the last thing you do is is plant the garlic, and um, but you know there are other options too. And I, I was you know telling some other people just this this past week. Well, we're not 
uh, selling vegetables right. to other people from our garden. Right. Uh, right. Sometimes, just, sometimes we give some away if we've got right. too much. But it's just, it's just overall good. I mean, it's like, it's like putting compost in your garden, except you don't have to like compost it. It's just sort of uh, sheet composting. But uh, something I've done in the past too is just to uh, to spread. Uh, and here we have the growing great garlic. Uh, Book by Ron England, highly recommended by the way. Oh uh, yeah, Growing he, Great Garlic by yeah. Ron England. Yeah, and then uh, actually, I guess we could show the the cover of the uh, Managing Cover Crops uh, book. Uh, that's uh, one. I it, it, it I, I don't know. I, I I actually myself couldn't put it down and had like dreams of gardening and, and farming all night after I, I read that. Uh, but uh, we do have a shot. I did uh, beef up some beds. Uh, with a lot of compost and again the Jersey green sand and lime, but um, uh, I, I did plant uh, some winter rye onto that and it was it was looking really good. There's, there's a couple of shots where uh, the that's where it's just starting to come in and that was about ten, well yeah about ten pickup truck load fulls of compost on those two beds, and then the Jersey green sand, the the lime, and then uh, uh, that was that was planted actually about a month ago only and uh, that's another shot of it from the other direction where it's grown a little bit more and then I believe we have one more it's it's about a foot tall so that's um, the garlic that we're no, seeing no no that's the, that's the winter rye that's the winter, winter, rye. winter rye bed okay yeah. and that's going to be just I've, I've gardened here before but I just wanted to beef that area up and, and make it you can see now there's there's compost in the right hand uh, the bed to the right of those two green beds mm -hmm. and uh, so you know again probably by next April that'll be up waist tall and then uh, we'll uh, I'll you know I, I oftentimes cut it first and let it dry for a couple of days because if you turn it in green it tends to just like decompose like too quickly and a lot of the nutrients just just evaporate more quickly so if you cut it and let it dry so it's almost more like hay and then you know turn it in then your nutrients will stay there longer your, your organic matter will uh, maintain a little bit longer too but um, but you know a, another thing you can do uh, I've actually done this underneath my tomato plants is just broadcast like a low growing white clover seed underneath the plants while they're growing and then you've got a mat of clover so then you don't have have weeds uh, coming in so readily and uh, I, I often, I've, I was telling a friend of mine out in Ohio, she has chickens, and I said, well, I said, between every row of corn, what I, I've done is plant five rows of soybeans, and we, you wait for the corn to get eight to ten inches tall, then you plant five rows of soybeans in between your corn, and then, you know, the corn's going to stay a little bit taller than the, uh, the soybeans, but there's, you're not going to have weeds growing in your walkway because you have all these soybeans in there, and then, um, you know, you improve the soil by uh, <coughs> adding a leguminous uh, uh, undersown, or they, they call it an undersown or an oversowing uh, uh, crop to that. And uh, that way, you know, and, and then if you have chickens or something like that, you can actually send the chickens in there. They'll eat up any of the last corn cobs that weren't, weren't harvested, and then uh, they'll eat up all that. That soy turkeys uh, love that too. Uh, but uh, so you can actually grow cover crops while you're growing other crops and and even you know something I, I didn't I never really thought about it but I tried this maybe oh gosh I don't know maybe 10 years ago or so and it worked fantastic but had some really nice soil to start with and there was a couple of the beds I was going to plant um, melons into I, I, I love my watermelons and cantaloupes but I planted I got field peas and at the time you would normally plant your sweet peas in, in March, I just rototilled up, I broadcast the, uh, the peas, and then just lightly fluffed them in with the tiller, and they started to grow, and you figure if it was, let's say, you know, March 21st, uh, you go to what, April 21st, like about the middle of May, I had knee-deep peas growing all over these beds, and I turned them under, and boy, I have to say, I mean, the best melons the the most plentiful melons I, i've ever grown but uh you know peas fix nitrogen in the soil so they actually added uh, a lot of nutrient they added the, added their uh, their nitrogen and uh all that organic matter to the soil so you could actually plant a cover crop in late march that you're going to till in in the middle of may before you plant uh anything uh in that uh in that soil and even you know, uh, some of the things I was, I was, uh, I have done this, but I was reading, they say, you know, if you're just going to leave something, 
you know, you've harvested something, it's like, well, we're going to plant something in there later. You could plant another quick, like a cover crop, like just buckwheat, just broadcast buckwheat seed in there. It'll grow up, it'll keep your weeds down, uh, add nutrients to the soil, and, uh, uh, you know, and, and all of the, uh, we, we could pull up the, uh, the other benefits of, uh, uh, of cover cropping on uh, there. So it cuts your fertilizer costs, so you don't need uh, to spend as much on fertilizer. Sometimes you don't need any fertilizer, and it reduces the needs for herbicide and other pesticides because... You, you know, don't want to eat poison. Right, right. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's just like getting away from, uh, from all that, uh, you know, in a natural way. I mean, you're planting a crop, and, uh, and, and then, you know, it does improve your, uh, your yields because it enhances the soil health. Uh, prevents erosion. Sometimes, you know, in the winter time, you don't have anything on your on your soil. There's nothing growing there, and then you get a big, you know, rainstorm or snow melts, and then your soil washes away. Uh, but you know, conserving soil moisture, it doesn't dry out mm -hmm. as quickly when there's something on top of it. And then, again, protecting uh, water quality because you don't have all the the runoff, and uh, and then it helps safeguard your personal health and and you know even the health of like you have employees or even your neighbors uh, right. don't, don't have right. to uh, uh, deal with uh, with the spraying and stuff. And uh, and then there's a lot of different things you can you can plant too. I mean, it's I, winter rye is very it's it's the most commonly um, grown cover crop in the in the Northeast uh, United States, and you can plant it as early as say mid August, but. Uh, you can go. You can go as late as uh, as mid October. I mean, so the middle of October. I think most people their gardens are pretty well done. But even so, like like I have a lot of cabbage out right now, uh, still, which I, it looks like maybe maybe in the next couple of days I should harvest the, the last of it. But uh, but you can actually broadcast the seed right over the the plants, and whatever gets to the ground will grow up around them. And then uh, you know it's not going to be a dense. Um, planting like like I showed uh, in that that picture, but uh, there will be uh, uh, you know some some cover crop growth there instead of nothing, and uh, so you know you can, if if you think about it, you can probably figure out times that you could do little little plots of it, and uh, and you know and some of them are really beautiful too. I mean uh, the uh, buckwheat has has nice little white flowers on it, and oftentimes. Uh, Bees do like to come to it. A oh, lot of, oh a lot of bees clothing. love buckwheat. Right. Yeah. Although, although there's a there's a Japanese buckwheat that that they don't go to at all. I, I remember the one year I'm looking at my buckwheat and I've got a pretty good sized patch of it. And I'm just like, there isn't one bug out here at all. And then I saw a fly, and that was about it. There wasn't any any bees on it. But for some really? reason, there's there's certain certain types of buckwheat that that do oh. not uh, oh. uh, attract oh, them. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, and I, I did actually grow a mix once with this. Uh, uh, crimson clover, but uh, and another thing too is like I, I, I say to people like I know I know people like oh you know the garden I don't even know what I'm going to do. It's like well you know if, if you're kind of in a pinch like sometimes people are you know something else is going on in your life you're moving you know kids are moving you know something it's like you got a lot going on you don't have time for the garden plant the whole garden in the cover crop and just forget about it for a year or um. plant half of your garden into a into a longer term cover crop that you can just leave mm -hmm. and only grow you know. Uh, half of a garden. Okay, speaking of um, a long-term uh, cover crop, um, now this buckwheat and uh, rye that you speak about, um, are these things that could be harvested to make flour out of? You could, you could. I, I know one, one of my clients is like, so you make, you make buckwheat flour out of the buckwheat? I'm like, I've never harvested the buckwheat, buckwheat at all. But, and then, you know, the rye you could also, and I, I mean, I've grown barley to harvest, I, I, my, my plan was I wanted to make, I, I grow my own hops, and I was gonna grow my own barley to- uh, uh, To make to, beer? To, to make my own beer, except the thing is, is growing the barley is not the hard part. Um, and, and maybe it's not hard if you know what you're doing, but the um, malting process, you have to soak the seed, and you have to let the seed germinate a little bit, then you have to, have to dry it and, and, and um, roast it, so. Um, I, I never did uh, do did that. I did, I did harvest. I don't even know what I did. I think I just planted it out again next year. But I had I had paper grocery bag fulls of um, of, uh, of barley. But uh, yeah, so I mean, yeah, you, you could. I mean, you, you definitely could if you wanted to. But that's typically not the purpose when you're uh, when you're raising cover crops. The cover crop is primarily 
to uh, improve the soil for another uh, another cash crop coming in. And like in this picture here, you see these are like rows of kale, and they have some sort of um, grass crop uh, growing in between. And this uh, lady here is is holding uh, these are either oil seed or like a daikon radish. And oh, one of the things about yeah, radishes yeah, yeah. with the deep the deep tap root. If you just leave that in the ground, all that organic matter is going to be in that hole in the in the soil, and um, it it helps your you know heavier soils to to drain better. Uh, this looks like grapes with uh, 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 it's it's some sort of a I, I'm going to guess I, I saw this in in the, this this is a Johnny selected seed catalog and he has oh four or five pages of uh, of uh, it looks like so that, that yeah it might be a mustard it says this is uh, mighty mustard Pacific gold, uh, but uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of the local uh, um, grape farmers do do plant uh, cover crops in between their uh, their rows. However, I I personally don't like this, but they'll usually spray it with herbicide to uh, to Ew, kill it back. Yeah, but yeah. Um, uh, not my thing. And, and and actually, this this is sort of this is not the mix that I've used, but there's a uh, a mixture I've used before. It's it's considered a soil building mix, and it's a mixture of peas vetch and oat grass and the the oats grow up really really tall really fast and then the um, uh, the peas and the vetch just grow up the oat stalks and I've done it in some poorer soils and it's still grown you know four and five feet tall but uh, the one year that I grew it where I lived in in, in um, Forestville uh, I, I was like I, I the, the it was it was the stuff was like seven or eight feet tall um, so I, I was like, what, what am I going to do here? And I didn't have a brush hog then. So I actually had to go through it with a, a weed whacker just to chop it down because there was just so much material there. And then it was really hard for my walk behind tiller to even get through that stuff. But, I mean, it, it made a mat of, of really good uh, uh, organic matter in there. But um, So that, that's considered a soil building mix. And they in Johnny's here, they have a pea and oat mix. They don't have the, uh, the vetch in it. And then... Uh, you know, they have spring mixes. There's a fall, they call this a green manure uh, uh, mix. I see there's crimson clover and uh, fast-growing uh, uh, rye peas and, uh, yeah, crimson clover and hairy vetch. So, you know, all the, some of those are leguminous. Some of them are, are grasses, and uh, they will, uh, you know, I mean, they, they feed the soil. They increase your uh, uh, soil life is what they, they call it. So when you have fresh, green, organic matter in the soil, it invites the microbes, it invites the, uh, the bacteria and stuff to break that stuff down. It, you'll get more earthworms in your soil that way, and it, it really does help. And especially, I, I like to like, use the, the winter rye. It has such a really tough and fibrous root system that it breaks up and it just pulverizes the soil particles. So you're, the condition of your soil is just really, really uh, nice and, and fluffy after a... a a season of uh, of winter rye, and even um, sunflowers can be grown as a as a cover crop. I mean, there's a lot of organic matter in the uh, in the stalks of the uh, of the sunflower. But uh, but yeah, for a longer term thing, I mean, clover is a really good. You know, you could plant clover for uh, for a couple of years. Uh, alfalfa is a good uh, uh, longer term uh, cover crop. But uh, yeah, like like uh, buckwheat. Like I said, I think eleven or twelve weeks till it will form a seed so I mean you could always go out there and uh, take, take some of the seed but like what I did like I said I saved myself from having to buy more buckwheat seed by just letting it go to seed and then tilling it in a little bit so then those seeds would uh, would uh, would germinate um, uh, again the ones that I grew myself so that uh, um, saves on that but uh, yeah it, you know like I said a lot a lot of benefits to, uh, to using cover crops and, it, and in a lot of ways it's sort of like you know, a lot of people get you know compost from someone who has horses or uh, cows or something like that. And uh, I heard somebody, one farmer I used to work with in Vermont, he says, "Well, he says, I'm trying to take the cow out of the picture." So, you know, it, it's really basically taking the food that the cow or the horse would eat and tilling it under instead of feeding it to the cow and taking the uh, taking the manure afterwards and using that. So uh, it's. Uh, I guess less steps, uh, you know, more the exact like raw material going going into it. But uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it you know, it, it, you might find it if if you had a if if Carl had a spot where he could uh, uh, you know just leave like 
one bed in, in cover crop or two beds in cover crop for two years and then rotate that, rotate that into, into the rotation of your, uh, uh, your crops, you might, you might notice a difference uh, in that. But, uh, but yeah, like I said, I mean, it's not just for, you know, commercial growers. I mean, you would get better, better vegetables yourself out of uh, a smaller area with, uh, um, you know, because it does, it really does improve the soil health uh, in a big way. And, and I know even, even late, uh, there was, Cornell did a, a workshop, there's a, it's on Route 20, um, right near where the Finan Farms uh, building used to be, it's called Chautauqua Farms now, and I don't think the couple is doing this anymore, but they had a big like corn and, and pumpkin operation there. And uh, they planted a number of different test plots of different uh, cover crops, and uh, we all went out there for, uh, for a seminar, and it was really amazing in the short amount of time from you know the time that the corn ended, I mean it was probably in October when we were out there for the seminar. But I mean they had beautiful growth of like some uh, some brassicas. I mean you know because there's you know like uh, uh, I, I guess rape is one of the names. I didn't see any in here, but uh, um, uh, isn't but like, isn't that uh, where can uh, like the rape seed? Isn't that uh, um, the, like the canola Canola, plants. yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's canola seed, yeah, exactly. Uh, I don't see any of that in the... You know, that. speaking of the sunflowers, you mentioned the sunflowers a few minutes ago, mm -hmm. and um, there's something um, growing in one end of our garden. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll never get rid of it, you know. Um, it, it's called Jerusalem artichokes. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're yeah. related. They right. get have really tall... Yeah. stems like the yeah. sunflowers do yeah. Yeah, I've grown. and they have uh, pretty yellow flowers in, right. the, in the fall um, and uh, it, so they are related somehow right. but instead of the seeds you eat the root. Right, right. Um, yeah I, it, it's funny because I read about those like decades ago and I thought you know that, that just seems like such a nice idea and I thought uh -huh. you know when I ordered them I figured you know I don't know if you know when you plant a pound of potatoes usually get 10, pound back, 10 pounds back. So I thought, well, the Jerusalem artichoke is probably the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I ordered, a, I think it was a five pound bag of them. Well, then when I got them, they said that one ounce would produce 10 pounds. So I was like, oh, well, that's <laughs> more than I was expecting. And the, the property I was on in Ohio, uh, there had been landscapers there before, and they had brought in a tractor trailer full of cypress mulch. Uh -oh. And the people that had lived there before me were like, oh yeah, there's potting soil, there's potting soil over there. And I looked at it and said, oh, I see, there's this really nice like composted stuff here. So the year that I got the uh, the Jerusalem artichokes, I thought, well, I did hear that they're really hard to get rid of sometimes and they will spread into your garden. So I thought, you know what, let's, let's put them over there. That's away from the normal garden mm -hmm. site. Mm -hmm. And uh, I planted them directly into that. Once they came up, I hand weeded it Went to a neighbor and I got some horse manure out of their, their barn. It was really like like matted down and it was like flakes almost of compost. So it wasn't it wasn't like real crumbly. So I just laid that like a mat on top, there's in sections on top of that. And all I did other than that was I put a, a straw mulch over the top and it was a dry summer. So I, I watered it. That's all I did other than, other than that. And those things grew. I went out there with a yardstick and I measured. They were 14 feet tall to the yeah. top. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and I, I harvested. I got a little bit. They probably gave me a little bit more than five pounds, but um, I harvested something like 1,200 pounds of Jerusalem artichokes out of out of that that plot. Uh, you know, by were you able fun. to sell them? Or oh, I, yeah. Restaurants were buying them like crazy. Were they? Even, what yeah. does the restaurants use them for? Well, there's one little place. Uh, it was in Kent, Ohio, and it was called. Uh, the the diner and it would it had been it had been like a really like kind of a greasy spoon like place the place you would go to to drink after you drank too or to eat after you drank too much at the bars uh, when you were in college but uh, uh, it, it was it, they I don't even I believe somebody was talking about it on Facebook recently I don't even believe they had a had a bathroom in the place but it was a it was an old dining car of a uh, of a of a train and uh, they just parked it on this corner in the in this alley in, in Kent. And uh, this couple came through, and they had all these fresh new ideas. And he was quite a, a good uh, chef. I think they both were, were really good chefs. And uh, he would buy anything that I, I brought him because I always grew things that were a little bit uh, out of the ordinary and exotic. And uh, and he loved all that kind of stuff. So uh, I started bringing him. I, I told him I said I'm going to have these things. So he got an LL Bean cookbook, 
And he made a, it was like a Jerusalem artichoke leek soup. So it was sort of like a leek potato soup, but substituting the, the Jerusalem artichokes for those. And then uh, he had uh, Jerusalem artichoke croquets, which were sort of like a potato pancake uh, made out of uh, Jerusalem artichokes. But uh, uh, you've, you've eaten them, though? Are you, you've eaten yours? Uh, yes. Um, it's been my experience that if you cook them, they don't taste good. Hmm. Uh, they taste okay um, if you eat them raw. Yeah, they're nice, kind of like a Chinese chestnut. Almost. You know, um, cooked, I, I don't care for them. Um, but you'll usually, if you have them <laughs> in your yard or anything, you'd never be able to use them all because and they're hard to clean, you know, yeah, to, they are. They're to eat. Yeah, kind of like ginger. And, and, you know, it's... Um, it's definitely the least favorite plant food of mine. Mm. However, do you know uh, that they are the only northern, um, the only native North American vegetable? Are they period. really? A lot of people say, well, corn. It's like, well, first of all, corn is not a vegetable; it's a grain. And mm. second of all, corn came from South America, okay. so it, it's really the okay. only native North American vegetable. But it is my understanding that uh, Jerusalem artichokes uh, help to. Um, balance blood sugar right. levels right uh so they're good and, for and, that and, and and farmers use them for forage for for cows and stuff like that too mm -hmm. but yeah i think i don't if think they have a lot of flavor in and of themselves mm -hmm. i mean it's you know you think of like well like how many people would eat a baked potato without anything on it you know mm -hmm. so it's like mm -hmm. well mm -hmm. it's like a jerusalem artichoke you're just going to eat a steamed jerusalem mm -hmm. artichoke it's like I, I think if you season it uh, properly and like I said, that that soup was a big hit at uh, at the restaurant and those. So uh, he sold a lot. Oh yeah, I mean, I I I I know I, I sold like I, I grew about twelve hundred pounds. I sold about a thousand pounds, and he was he was buying like you know forty and fifty pounds a week for me just just that one little place. I have had pasta. Uh, the part of the flour that it was made out of was Jerusalem artichoke flour. Right. And somehow it tasted okay that way. Right. Right. You know. Yeah, like I said, I think I think it just depends on how, how you season it. I I do have a recipe somewhere in a file <clears throat> where it was it was actually supposed to be a, a Native American fall salad, and it was just like grated uh, raw uh, Jerusalem artichoke, and uh, and of course they say that you know the Jerusalem part of it. They 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 say that. Um, they, they 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 were originally grown here and then they were taken to Europe and they think that the they, they say have really have nothing to do with Jerusalem but uh, no I, no it's not uh, like it's it's not actually an artichoke no it's no. it's it's right. I don't know why they call it, it, it yeah that. some people call it's, them sun, yeah. sun chokes or for sun those, choke tubers or for those of you in the viewing audience uh, it's not anything like the artichokes you buy no, in the it's grocery a tuber that grows store. On the ground, but so. but they they believe that like the I, I understand I don't under, I don't know Italian, but they say that in Italian that the the word for turning towards the sun is like gerasai, and that sounds something like Jerusalem. So when they brought them back from Europe to this country, they'd be like, yeah, I don't know, Jerusalem artichoke, whatever, you know. So that's, oh, you know, it's, oh. it's really misnamed. Uh, but yeah, they're not an yeah. artichoke and they're not from Jerusalem at all. Right, they're, right. Like I said, native, native. And, and I don't know if you ever noticed, but uh, if you know what they look like, you can see them along roadsides uh, growing, growing wild uh, along here, uh, you know, anywhere in Chautauqua County, actually. And uh, something you didn't mention, I don't know if you know this, but you mentioned the yellow flowers. Mm -hmm. If you smell the inner part of that flower, the center of those flowers, they actually have like a, a chocolatey kind of a, a scent to that. Oh, you, I'll have you, to uh, check that out next next, next, next fall. <laughs> next year <laughs> little, when little they late. blossom. Well, I No, I never put them up to my nose. Yeah, I always noticed that they were really they, pretty you, to I look at. I don't know if you at. ever do that, but I mean, they do make kind of a nice cut flower. I mean, I, I like to cut, you know, some fairly long, long branches of them, put them in a, in a vase with... Uh, Water and uh, they're they're pretty decent that uh, just to look at. Just yeah, they are beautiful to look at. Yeah. They, they really are. So. And actually, I've grown three different varieties. I um, I you have the normal ones, the big white ones, but uh, there was one that I grew that was sort of a orange or color, and then another one that was red. I mean, just the skins were were a different color. Oh, the skins and they, were a different They were color. not quite as aggressive and, and you know, prolific as the uh, the white ones. Somebody um, told me that the red ones are better tasting than the white ones. Maybe. 
that I, if it is, it's not a huge difference. <laughs> uh, Probably not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, but honestly, I mean, I, uh, you know, I've eaten them a lot. I mean, uh, the the uh, the white ones like you have, and I mean, I, I'll I'll just like, you know, even just like clean them, steam them, and one of the things I'll do is I'll just take some of them and I'll just rinse them off with a hose, and then sometimes I, I put them in a bucket with water and just let the hose like, uh, you know, churn them up just to, to to clean them off. And another thing is too, they they don't keep really well, so. Like harvesting them early to put them in a root cellar or keep them in the refrigerator is not the best thing. And when I grew them uh, that first year, I knew that I wasn't going to be able to sell them all and harvest them all before the winter. So I took bales of hay and just set bales of hay all over that um, that whole area. And then when I wanted to go out and dig them, even in the winter time, I'd roll a bale of hay, get underneath there with a shovel or a spading fork, and then just uh, um, you know pull them up that way. Uh, and uh, and then you know they were good and fresh like like right out of the ground, um, uh, you know in in the winter time. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean I I don't know I, I think like I said I, I I think like personally if they're they're seasoned properly I, like I said I would just like steam them you know salt pepper maybe a little olive oil or something like that just like a, a mashed potato I think uh, uh, is one way that I would pre- prepare them. But uh, and then those those croquets I mean you think about like a potato pancake I mean what else would be in that but like Mm-hmm. Some flour, maybe some egg or mm-hmm. uh, something like that, and again some some seasoning. But they were just like, uh, um, you know, just like I said, like a potato pancake, just grated and uh, and fried. And then, uh, like I said, he that soup was like very very popular. I mean, he had mm-hmm. that soup on the menu the entire fall and uh, and winter. Well, he must place. have put some really good flavored other right. ingredients right. in with it because. Right. Well, you think I mean, uh, if you're going to make potato soup, you wouldn't just put potatoes and water in it. You know? <laughs> I mean, you you would probably add some onion and some garlic, garlic and, and some, some other herbs and, and maybe some other vegetables. Right, and, right, exactly. Yeah, like like they have. Like, I know a lot of people make uh, make garlic soup, and I know a friend of mine was saying that she puts like chunks of zucchini and carrot and stuff like that in it for. Uh, a, uh, a different flavor, but, uh, but yeah, I actually liked them. I mean, I, I grew a lot of them. I, I knew some farmers up in Vermont that uh, that grew like huge, huge uh, mm-hmm. parcels of, mm-hmm. uh, of the Jerusalem artichoke or sunchokes, I guess they're called. But <clears throat> and another thing is like like I'm saying about these cover crops is if you do have you know fowl or you know chickens or, or turkeys or something, they'll go in and eat that stuff, and it's really great for uh, for their health as well. And uh, in a lot of cases, they'll mm-hmm. leave their uh, uh, debris behind and mm-hmm. feed the soil mm-hmm. as well. Well, we do have, uh, we do tend to see uh, wild turkeys in our garden starting late in the fall, you know. Yeah, well, and I have, I mean, I have hickory nut trees all around my property, but uh, I also maintain about a half acre of uh, clover for the, for the deer. But if I just mow my, my fields, there's there's clover all over the place. Uh, it, you know, my, I have about a, I don't know, about a six acre just open field. Is that the red clover that you? Uh, it's the, what I planted was actually, I actually planted a mixture of, of red and white just to have a, a, a cross in there. But then uh, a friend of mine who was helping me, he ended up putting in, I think it's a, it's a white clover, but it's designed to have like more protein. So it, it's supposed to be better for the deer. Uh, and so, uh he planted that in that that plot, but yeah, around the around the the uh, uh, the fields. If I just keep it mowing, I, I think part, it was because the lady who had the house before me, she had horses. So, and uh, that's one of the things that uh, a lot of people don't like to use horse manure compost in their gardens because they they, they complain that you get too many weed seeds. Well, <coughs> cows when they eat, they digest seeds completely. Horses do not. But to me, it's, I don't know, Elliot Coleman always told us, of the, of the bigger animals between the cow and the horse, he said, if you have a choice, use horse manure. He said horse manure is the best uh, of, between a, a horse and a cow. Uh, but uh, the one thing I have, or I'm dealing with right now, a lot of that compost that was in those pictures, uh, in a way, a lot of people like this, and it is good for the fact that you don't get weed seeds mixed in with like straw if they're using straw for bedding, but if they use sawdust or wood chips, you're not getting those extra seeds, but uh, it, it, it tends to take years longer for the wood chips to break down, and there's terpenes and pitch and other, like there's, there's things in wood that's actually toxic to vegetable plants that they will inhibit growth. Um, so um, 
what I get has the wood chips in it, but I, 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 it has to be three or four years old before it'll be uh, usable in the garden. Because the, like I said, the wood, I, one year I want to say it was the fall of 98, uh, the summer of 99, I had one of my worst gardens ever because I went to go get the compost. The pile was opened up and I told them, that just, just leave it the way it is. I said, I'll be back tomorrow and I'm going to take that. Well, I think they thought, well, if we pile all the new stuff on top of the old stuff, he'll just take more. Well, I only have time in a day to take five loads, so I got a lot of the newer stuff with a lot of wood chips in it, and uh, I spread it immediately. Well, if I spread it and turn it under, it'll stay wetter, and it'll compost better through the winter, and uh, there was still, like, so much wood chip in that soil and sawdust in that soil that super dry, droughty summer of 99, first of all, and uh, it just wouldn't hold the moisture. The, 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 the ground just wouldn't, wouldn't stay, stay moist. And I mean, I had tomato plants planted over here. And when I pulled them up, their root systems were like six oh, feet across, oh my just God. trying to get to okay. something. So. Well, I hate to say it, but we've come to a, the end of another episode of Fresh Perspectives. Thank you for coming on. Well, congratulations. It's always I feel honored to be uh, the, on the, the, the 100th, 100th show. episode. Right. Yes. <laughs> and. Um, uh, thank you again to uh, Reed Powers, Russ Valone, Devin and Nancy Taylor, uh, Randy Burt, Chris Burt, Justin Burt, Dak Hamill. Um, let Your me think. loving husband. Get my that. husband. <laughs> uh, my husband, Carol Erb, and um, uh, Jeff Sook, um, Dak Hamill. Um, let's see. Uh, Chuck Kelsey. Your parents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, um, anyway, just thank you to all of you uh, who have made uh, Fresh Perspectives a program that's lasted a hundred episodes and still going strong. <laughs>